Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with two significant players uh, in the utility space. Uh, we have with us Calvin Butler, the chief executive right. of Exelon, and Pedro Pizarro, who is the chief executive of Edison International, the parent company of Southern California Edison. And he's also the chairman of the board for the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, please give them a f warm welcome. Uh, now, now, the energy transition uh, is the most important part of comb combating climate change. And a lot of the focus is on the energy source, wind turbines, geothermal, and solar. But you can't plug your car into a, a wind turbine. That last mile of electricity delivery is really crucial, and that's managed by utility companies. And the big question that I'm often raising is, who pays and who gets paid? Mm -hmm. So in this discussion that we'll have for the next several minutes, um, we want to begin with just trying to understand, you know, at a basic level, what role do utilities play in helping the U.S. move away from fossil fuels. Pedro? Great. Well, I, Ivan, thanks so much for having us here. Uh, and I did have a visual image of a car with a wind turbine <laughs> attached to it. It might be a new innovative idea. Uh, look, you, uh, electric power companies are really at the critical epicenter of this transition. Because as we've done analysis, and Edison International just published our latest white paper of countdown to 2045, you know, looking at how California, world's fifth largest economy, gets in at zero. You know, the punchline is we can get there as an economy, but it's going to require a lot of clean energy moving over a strong electric grid to electrify a lot of the economy. And that's the punchline. I think it's not only about where we need to head, but also where we've been, right? Because that shows the commitment that our industry, our sector, has had to this transition already. If you look back uh, at power use in the country, I think it's grown something like 73% since 1984, but our emissions from the sector are still about the same. <laughs> and so, uh, in fact, if you look at what the Obama Clean Power Plan would have called for utilities doing and power companies doing, um, uh, and that plan unfortunately was, did not make it through the court system, but you know what, our sector actually met and in fact beat the reductions called for in President Obama's uh, Clean Power Plan, and we did it earlier than it would have been scheduled. So we know we are critical partners in this transition, but it's not just about us. It's a transition that needs to cover and include the entire economy. Calvin, your perspective on that? Absolutely, Ivan, thank you. And uh, thank you for engaging in this important conversation. So let me put it in context. Pedro did a wonderful job framing it um, for us as an industry understand a little bit about who Exelon is. Exelon has the responsibility and privilege to serve about 10 and a half million customers. And we serve uh, those customers across some of the largest cities in the United States, Chicago, the District of Columbia, Baltimore, Philadelphia. In addition to that, we are pure TND. So we're pipes and wires. We have no generation. So I think our role in this is critical, as Pedro said, and I think of it in three ways. One, we had to start internally. So we had to walk the talk. So what were we going to do to reduce our carbon footprint and really show our communities that we serve in urban America, rural America, and coastal how to do this? So we set our own path to clean. The second piece, as Pedro alluded to, is partnerships and collaboration. What are we doing as a company to partner with the national labs? Pedro was on the Argonne National Lab, and I, I get to be his successor on that. The labs play a critical role in how we go out and really talk about technology investment and what we're doing to shape this debate. And then I would say the third piece is what we have to do is modernize the grid. When we talk distributive energy resources, how are we going to connect and transport them across the country? The building out of that transmission system, the building out of pipes and wires to deliver that in a reliable and resilient way is critical. And encompassed about all of that, I like to think of it in terms of equity and energy. It has to be affordable. Everyone in here talks about this transformation, and it's so important. 
But if you don't do it in an affordable manner that's equitable across all of our communities, this transformation, this transition of our industry is going to be piecemeal and it really won't happen. Well, so that leads me to, to wonder, okay, what, what incentives d does your industry have to change? One, given that you know, most people see that they get charged per unit of electricity that they use. Mm -hmm. But if consumers are using less or even generating uh, their own electricity, how does that affect the bottom line? Well, it actually depends on where you look, right? In California, in I think a couple dozen other states, the business model most customers don't understand actually uh, addresses the, the, the very issue you're bringing up, Ivan. We have something called decoupling. It means that our revenues are decoupled from the actual electron sales. So although customers, to your point, might be getting charged a fixed charge and a variable charge, from a utility perspective, right, the power company perspective, um, the revenues in decoupled states don't depend on those kilowatt hour sales. There is no incentive for the utility to sell more electricity to make more money, right? Um, for us, the, our, in our earnings potential for our investors, for putting up the capital to build the grid, is really linked to um, getting a, an authorized level of capital investment and an authorized rate of return on that investment. Uh, and so that means that we are focused very much on the grid and those investments that regulators have approved and have determined to be in the public interest. And that aligns uh, interest with customers. One final thing I'll say there is that we recognize we have a big job to do, right? You look at Southern California Edison, which serves about 15 million residents um, in 40% of California or so. Um, right now, SCE is investing around $6 billion a year. It just filed a rate case application for the 25 to 28 period that would bump that up to $8 billion because of all the work that we see we need to right. do for our customers. We need to harden the grid. We've been making investments to support wildfire mitigation. We need to expand the grid and not only transmission but distribution, right? Uh, more and more distributed resources, more electric vehicles, heat pumps, solar panels, batteries. And you need to expand and modernize the system to Calvin's earlier point to make that all work um, while we maintain uh, affordability for customers. So we're working hard too on how we lower cost, how we you know, use technologies like digital and generative AI to lower the cost of service because we recognize there's a big investment need that we have. And the very final quick point here though is that our analysis shows that as we go through this clean energy transition, although customers will be using more electricity as more of their life becomes electrified, and yes, electric rates may be going up because of the investments we'll need to make for more renewables and storage and grid. Because electric technologies are more efficient than fossil fuel technologies, you know, when you drive a mile in an electric car, you're using less energy overall than when you burn gasoline in a combustion engine car. That drives, in our view, in our analysis, our average customer household in 2045 will be spending more on electricity, but if you add up their total energy bill, gasoline plus natural gas plus electricity, that will be 40% lower in real terms than it is today. But a, a big criticism yeah. um, of the utilities. He's gonna give that one to me, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I teed it out. He was like, you got it, go ahead. <laughs> right. There's been obviously a big criticism of the utilities that oftentimes the efforts by consumers to put solar on their homes. Yeah. Um, the utilities have uh, slow walked, mm -hmm. uh, helping to connect those, the, those folks uh, getting their systems up, getting connected to the grid. So to, to what extent do you, you think the utilities view distributed energy via solar rooftop solar power or, uh, or otherwise as a, as a threat? No, it's, for us, it, it's not, again, as a pure distributor of energy, deliverer of energy, it's not a threat, but let me, you're absolutely right. For us, I can speak for Exelon, we have had our challenges because it was a different muscle we had to flex. When we had customers calling, saying it was a volume that we didn't anticipate. And I'm, using, I'm thinking specifically about the District of Columbia. They've had more interconnection requests and the number of jobs that we didn't have staff ready to handle. And it was a different type of request. So what we did, we utilized technology in a couple of ways. One, we created a website where developers and homeowners could go on and say where we had capacity. So they knew, 
And then we tried to uh, digitize the process of being able to get it done. So we did have a, a ramp up period, so own that. It's not a threat from a standpoint of getting it done because we are partnering with our jurisdictions. Our jurisdictions have been very clear of the goal of decarbonization in each one of the cities, and we're partners in that. But we have to retrain. We have to make the process easier because we never want to be perceived as that roadblock. To Pedro's point on the other one is that we have to continue to invest because not one of our jurisdictions are asking us, Ivan, to do less. They're asking us to do more each and every day to meet this commitment, and we have to ramp up our teams. Uh, uh, how much is permitting uh, a, a part of that, that challenge of it's overcoming big, the slow walking? It's a big part of it, right? And the reality is that we have such a big job ahead in deploying infrastructure. Our countdown to 2045 analysis revealed that uh, the amount of, well, first, the, the load growth that we're going to see is significant, yeah. right? Because to get to net zero across the economy, you have to electrify a lot of things in the economy, that's going to take um, our load in California as a whole, uh, that's a good example, um, from what's well, been fairly flat over the last decade, uh, we see it growing on over 80% through 2045. To get there, we're gonna need to add a whole lot of renewables to the system, a whole lot of storage to the system, and we're gonna need to, need, need to add wires for that. And so we see the rate of transmission development needs to be quadruple what it's been historically. The rate of distribution wire, the local wire development, is going to need to be 10 times what it's been historically. And so permitting and siting is critical. We need help. We've gotten a little bit of help already. So uh, it's a place where EEI has been very engaged and we got some support in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, uh, the debt ceiling uh, bill uh, that had some reforms to the federal NEPA process, Environmental Policy Act uh, uh, process. Uh, in California, we now have a series of bills waiting for the governor's signature that would help expedite transmission, permitting, and siting. But I think as you look nationally, we all need more help with this because the reality is we need that steel in the ground. So I've been, you know, I always think about these things. Pedro's absolutely right. Siting and getting, no one wants it done in their backyard, but they all want it. Mm -hmm. I think where we all can lean into that discussion and that debate is working with our local, state, and federal officials to ensure an alignment of policy. It's one thing to pass, get a law passed, but then when you go to implement that law at the local and state level, there's continued to be headaches or roadblocks along the way. So therefore, the time frame is not matching the goals, and if you do not have that alignment of policy, 10 years from now, we're all gonna be sitting back saying what happened or why didn't we do something. Well, can you, can you each describe what your, your energy mix looks like right now? Well, it depends on the jurisdiction for us because all of my jurisdictions have different goals. So you take um, DC. DC is saying they're gonna be 100% clean energy, I wanna say by 2031. So you take Illinois. Governor Pritzker has put out there, I believe, a goal of 2045. You know, so all of them have different, so then what, what does that mean? How they go out and I buy that power in bulk power agreements, I'm the purchaser, and my, but my interest, the interesting part of this, my commitment is to buy the cheapest electricity. I'm agnostic to source unless it's being driven by the jurisdiction. My commitment to my customers is to get it at the best price. So therefore the state sets the rules as to the mix they're going to bring in. So that's how I approach it. In Illinois, a lot of that base, um, base load generation is nuclear. So they tend to have a cleaner stack than any of my other jurisdictions. So most of my jurisdictions, we're our net receivers of power. So therefore, they have to go out on the market and get it. Well, and, but you're also, you, you believe that fossil fuels still play a role in, in where we are today, right? Well, it, it has to for a couple of reasons. Yes, but for how long is what we're, we're battling against? Because my number one commitment is to reliable and resilient service. And if, if you go home and you turn on, the, you flip the switch and the lights don't come on, that's real. So I have to provide that. And then my next piece is on the affordability of it because I can't leave 
those individuals that can't afford that electricity behind. So yes, it does. I do believe it plays, but now what we're working on is what are the policies to clean that stack up every day. Yeah, let me pitch in here too and give you the California example, right? Because you have scale there and you'll have a very progressive jurisdiction. Even in California, as we look at the most affordable and reliable way to get to net zero, um, we still see some fossil fuel in the mix with carbon capture. All right, so today we are, uh, at Southern California Edison's portfolio is around 40% carbon free. Uh, the state has uh, declared in statute that at the retail level, it will be 100% clean by 2045. Um, that still allows some fossil in the, up to the wholesale level. Um, when we look at the numbers, we, there's probably about 40 gigawatts of uh, renewables capacity statewide today. We think that needs to triple to around 120 gigawatts by 2045. We'll see tens of gigawatts of storage additions to that. Um, but importantly, we still see some use of natural gas. Um, it's probably a few percent in terms of the uh, electrons that get generated from natural gas. I think something like 40% of that natural gas flowing through the pipes will be renewable natural gas. We don't, we don't sell gas, so you know, we don't have a dog in that hunt, but we are a user through, through contracts. Um, and importantly though, the state gets in at zero. It's gonna need all those tools in the toolbox. A lot of renewables, a lot of storage, a lot of new technologies. We think there may be a need for things like certainly more offshore wind, um, small modular reactors, but carbon capture will need to play a role there because it will allow some continued use of some smaller portion of fossil fuel that can then deliver reliability at, at a more affordable price. Well, and, and you've been a, a, a you've uh, sort of portrayed as the climate champion, but um, just on this broader question of EEI and the, and the industry, um, EEI uh, picked someone that critics uh, have called a, a climate denier in, uh, in Dan Brulette as mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the chief executive. Um, how do you square the, uh, the push for, for reducing carbon emissions with questions about the industry's commitment to uh, reducing and eliminating fossil fuels. I'm glad you asked that because I love shooting alligators in the sewer. <laughs> um, and this one's deep in the sewer. Uh, so Dan Briette uh, is one of the most bipartisan people I've met. Um, and yeah, I'm very progressive. You got it, right? Um, but uh, I actually served on these, I was asked to serve on the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board um, during the Trump administration. Uh, it's a nonpartisan group. To be honest with you, I wanted to make sure that I could still espouse my very progressive beliefs and my commitment to California's journey, um, even while serving on that, and I was able to. Um, even though then President Trump tried to decimate DOE budgets, uh, Congress did not agree with that, and first Secretary Perry and then Secretary Briette actually worked in a bipartisan way with Congress. DOE's budgets for the clean energy transition were higher during the period than during the Obama period. Now maybe the president at the time didn't talk about climate change, he talked about US competitiveness, but the reality is the labs like Argonne and Idaho and uh, PNNL um, put more effort into renewables, storage, electric vehicles um, during Dan Briette's term as secretary than they ever had before. Uh, Dan also was confirmed with I think the largest bipartisan margin of anybody in recent history. And he's very committed to the clean energy transition. So I'm very proud to have been chair of EEI during the process of recruiting Dan and uh, look forward to helping him transition on board. He shares our commitment. If he didn't, I wouldn't have been okay hiring him. Well, well thank you gentlemen. Um, that's about all the time we have, uh, but we appreciate your perspective from the utility industry uh, on these pivotal issues. And thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for the time. <laughs>